interweb. So welcome everybody, and I mean everybody, to the spring 2018 uh, TWED Lightning Talks. Who, who has never done or never been here for one of these before? We got a, got a few. So, as, uh, yeah, yeah, Ben was right. You've been all right, one of our tenured grad students, and he's never been here. That's pretty much right. Um, so these are, this is meant to be a fun evening. This is meant to be a fun uh, sharing of, uh, of whatever interests you, you know, probably your research interests. Two minutes. Uh, as you can see, no slides, no notes, although a couple of people might cheat. Um, and and uh, we'll, we'll try to keep it the two. We would do a pretty good job. This is being uh, streamed and recorded. Um, and uh, if you're looking for seats, there's uh, there's a few seats up here. I think there's three seats that aren't taken up in the front row. So without further ado, uh, is Spencer here? Ah. They may still be upstairs. What part of six o'clock is hard to understand? Six the zero and the zero. They're the six into the zero and, and, and after the zero. All right. And do I see Alexander? I don't see Alexander either. Ah, this is getting interesting. I don't want to go first. All right. Well, we'll have the brave people go first. Go first. You, put your, you should have put your name in a lower row. When uh -huh. you put it in. Yeah. yeah. All right. So. Uh, Rock and roll. And cross out your name after you've spoken, please. And, and stand on the thing. That's why it's there. Beautiful. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm Sabir Rashid. I work with Deborah McGinnis. Um, some of the work I do relates to semantic annotation of structured data. And the way we do it is through semantic data dictionaries, which some of you guys may or may not have heard about. Um, and I won't go too, into too much detail here. But um, it's just a way of annotating data. And then we turn it through some interpretation process and create a data graph or knowledge graph. So what I will talk about is one of the projects we're using SCDs for, which um, is this work we're doing to annotate uh, NHANES, which is the nu nutritional health, no, national health and nutritional examination survey. Um, so that has a lot of data from, it actually started in the 1970s, but since about 15 years ago, they've been doing it every two years. Um, so for each year, they have about 10,000 subjects and um, the schema for what questions they ask and what data they take changes from year to year, but it's generally uh, somewhat similar. So we have things like, um, were you part of the military? Uh, what's your weight, age? Um, these kind of demographic characteristics, like do you have health insurance, life insurance, um, anthropometric method measures, like what's your height? And then we have um, actual analyzing the blood, like what's your mercury concentration? So what we're trying to do is annotate all this stuff so we can search for it through different data sets. And one of the, um, work we'll be doing this summer is try to automate this annotation, which is largely manual at the moment. All right. Thank you, Sabir. Right. Yeah. Is there a market across the right? Yes. Yeah, I'm right here. Yeah. Yeah. Get an X marks the spot. Now. Yes. Good. Yeah. Hey, everyone. Um, so as you may have noticed over the past five to 10 years, uh, deep learning has sort of taken over a lot of fields uh, due to its ability to uh, take raw input and learn some useful features for completing a, a particular task. One field in particular that's uh, greatly benefited from the tools and techniques developed in deep learning is computer vision. So um, you might consider image classification or object detection type tasks. And you can see that these deep learning models have greatly improved performance on these sorts of tasks. Uh, there are a number of tasks for which deep models alone may be uh, not particularly well suited. So for example, if you're trying to do uh, combine information that's contained within an image with some external information, 
Uh, I'll give an example here. If, you, if you're trying to referee a sports game, uh, that requires both the ability to perceive what's happening uh, on, on the field of play and combine that information with some knowledge that you have about the rules of the game, right? Uh, so in this case, uh, deep models alone can give you potentially the information that's happening within the field of play, but might not be so good at inferring then from that information uh, what's, uh, what's supposed to be happening, what's not supposed to be happening. So my work is in sort of bridging this divide between uh, deep models ability to perceive things well in images and external knowledge. The first step of this is to create uh, some kind of representation of uh, a perceptual input like an image that is that works well with uh, some external knowledge. And since external knowledge is often represented in the form of a graph, uh, work that I've done is in generating uh, what are called scene graphs that describe the content of an image. And then uh, in the future, this sort of thing can be paired with external information that uh, might be useful for the task that you're trying to do. And uh, sort of the, the second thing that, so that's, that's work that I've already done. The second thing that I'm working on now is in figuring out exactly what information to identify in an image so that it is uh, useful later on. So for example, you could think, of, going back to that, that refereeing example, uh, you may have some label data that labels uh, something as a foul or as an infraction or something like that. Um, but that might not be uh, something that's easy, easily perceived. That might already kind of include some of that external information that you're interested in. So I'm looking for more of a, a clean separation between this, uh, image, this information that's easily perceptible within an image and then uh, leaving things that are better suited for inferencing to be uh, reasoned over later on. Thanks. Thank you, man. And thank these people the way you'd like to be thanked. Like, Woohoo! <laughs> There's more seats up front here. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Katie Chastain. I'm an nth year grad student with um, Dr. McGinnis. And um, I've been working on also with the Semantic Data Dictionaries. I just completed a three-year tour of duty in the HPDD project, working with child health informatics. And I'm um, looking at uh, other ways, other applications of uh, Semantic Data Dictionaries, uh, most immediately working with um, Brenda, who I don't, is she here? Uh, I don't see Brenda, but um, working, I'm helping her out with some of her data. She has uh, some data from the Center for Disease Control and I'm gonna be helping her annotate some of that to see if I can make doing statistics with that data slightly less painful and require slightly less wrangling in R. So, um, and then I think after that, I'm going to be moving on to the, uh, what is it, the dynamic spectrum allocation project to see what I can do with semantic data dictionaries uh, over there, so. Excellent. Thank you, Katie. Yes. That was one minute. Uh, Jim McCusker, I'm a uh, research scientist at, uh, with Deborah McGinnis, and I am calling the, uh, the semantic bluff. Uh, we, we talk a lot about how semantics will help us with this or that or the other thing. I'm working to try to operationalize as much of the semantic infrastructure needed to actually do those things as possible. Uh, and doing it in the context of knowledge graphs uh, and trying to basically, so provenance, if we, uh, we need provenance, we have provenance. If we uh, want to do open-ended reasoning, we can do open-ended reasoning. If you want to do uh, interesting semantic user interfaces, you can do that. Uh, the the ap application uh, infrastructure is called Wyas, it's, and it's meant for building knowledge graphs. How many people here are interested in either interested or doing uh, building knowledge graphs or writing software that helps build knowledge graphs. Oh yeah. Yeah. So oh, yeah. You're all user why is users already, right? No? Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, so uh, this tool is for you. It's meant for developing knowledge graphs. You can write extra software to expand it. Uh, if it's really interesting and cool, we'll include it in the course so that other people can use it. You tell them, bro. And if, uh, if not, it's still good for your project. And 
uh, that's uh, that's what it's there for. So, Amen. I'm looking, for, I'm looking for users. Hallelujah. So is it calling a bluff when you've been bluffing already? For I haven't been bluffing. <laughs> I've been waiting for the chance to not call the bluff. So, yeah. All right. Thanks. All right. Do we have Spencer Alexander here yet? All right. All right. Ian, we your name down. I'll get it. Thank you, Jim. <laughs> okay. Hi there. Hi. So, my name is Ian Gross. I am a master student under Professor McGinnis, and I'm graduating this semester. Yay. <laughs> In five years. <laughs> uh, so you may have heard Jim just talk about WISE. So that was actually the inspiration for my work, which is related to information extraction and uh, introducing semantics into that output. So a lot of the work that WISE is able to do currently is it has some sort of manually processed data ahead of time. And you'll upload that via nano publications, which are more, uh, it's a way to describe knowledge. And <clears throat> There's one functionality where you basically upload a document and maybe you want to find some information out about that document itself. It could be like an article uh, specifically for like biomedical literature. It could be an image. Uh, in this case, I focus on biomedical uh, journals. But what if you want to know more about that journal itself rather than just you have a document and you may have some information about it. So my work is basically to make that data workflow or you have some sort of journal and you want to use information extraction to find the actual meaning behind that document. So I actually did a thesis on this work where I constructed a data workflow, which took a bunch of documents from the PubMed database and then <clears throat> converted those. Well, sorry, you process those in information extraction. I used two different tools, sorry, tools for those. And then afterwards, I did post-processing to convert those to a semantic annotation, uh, specifically the nano publications, and upload those to uh, WISE. And you can do a bunch of things with that from there. So uh, if you're interested in reading more, I suggest you read my thesis. <laughs> Thank you. Gordon? All right. Hey everyone, uh, are you working for what? Oh. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> working for Professor Fox, and uh, right now we are at the stage of uh, writing a new proposal for a new project. The name is uh, Autonomous Additive Manufacturing System for Materials Research. So the ultimate goal of this project is to try to replace the uh, human lab operator um, with some AI system you know, to do the uh, some 3D printing, it's either simulation or experiment and uh, iteratively. And, uh, and after each round, each cycle, you, the system can actually change the parameters automatically. So it will involve uh, machine learning and uh, semantic re reasoning, ontology engineering, something like that. And we will also apply what's called pro which spells as P-R-O-W-L, which is a um, probabilistic extension of the O-W-L language to do the uh, probabilistic reading. All right, thank you. Okay, so we have Jim Gross. Hi, Jim. Uh, Hello, my name is Ben O'Lee. Uh, I'm, hi. Uh, uh, <laughs> Student with uh, Professor Fox. I've been here for way too long. And um, my work is in data set change and sort of change capture using linked data. And the current the work that I'm currently doing is trying to develop uh, or collect evidence to develop this nomenclature for data sets. Because when we version data sets, we usually look at just the standard process of what's changed, what's not. But in addition to that, you know, we have data sets that never change or should it change, like um, um, from security cameras or just photography. So if you edit those to clear them up, you've, you've edited the original data. They're no longer admissible, right? We have different data sets that like climatology data sets that are updated periodically. And we have other data sets where, you know, sometimes you find new errors and then you upload data and then you wait a few years and then you find new errors and you upload data again. 
um, where it's you know intermittent. And so the idea is is uh, to identify um, characteristics within these data sets that will allow um, uh, uh, different patterns or usages or maybe lead to different practices uh, that are necessary to version or capture uh, change within these different kinds of data sets. All right. Uh, looking forward to your TWEG talk this fall. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> that was caught on tape. <laughs> Hello, everybody. My name is Hao. Um, I work with Professor Fox, too. Um, <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's nice. Like a a mark. There's, a, there's a mark. <laughs> um, so I'm currently working on a future research topic in the area of uh, policy awareness and data integration or through data integration. So policy generally means um, the interpretation of uh, what an organization or uh, or an agent want to achieve, and uh, usually data policy uh, usually refers to regulations, uh, uh, rules, uh, uh, standards that comes along with the data in a, throughout the whole data life cycle. Um, so, usually data po data policy covers areas such as um, security. Uh, access and quality, and quality is even more complicated too. And these issues becomes more complicated when data are combined or queries of data uh, or queries of data are combined together. Um, and, and policy awareness is a feature of an information system that helps users to try to help the users and help them to comply with the policies easier. So it's, and when some breach of policy happens, it, it helps, it helps uh, the recording and, uh, and uh, what's the word? Uh, um, the, uh, mitigating. Huh? Mitigating. Mitigating. Issues. Issues. <laughs> <laughs> All right. <laughs> <laughs> Let him do his talk. <laughs> so, my goal. So, the policy awareness issue exists throughout the whole throughout with exists with data throughout the whole data life cycle, and you. Should, but there's a lot of problem being created at the point when data are integrated from multiple resources, and uh, many troubles for uh, that. For example data privacy issues, they seem to occur at the point when data is being used being an, and analyzed after the point of integration, but it actually started at the point of data integration. So I see data integration as a point where we should look for solutions to promote data policy awareness. And I'm looking in research in this area. Thank you. All right, thank you. Rude. Where's the X? It's a post-it. Oh, I expected a big X. Awesome. There. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Hi, everyone. My name is Anirudh Prabhu. I'm also a grad student with Peter Fox. Uh, today, I wanted to talk to you about uh, a cool new paper we published last week. So um, we published it in PNAS, which is the Proceedings for National Academy of Sciences. Um, the title of the paper is Quanti let me say let me see if I can say this without messing up. Quantifying ecological impacts of uh, through network analysis of fossil samples, right? So, uh, thank you. So, uh, Howe and Emma, the co-authors on it with me, uh, with Peter and people from Harvard. Uh, so, uh, what we did in this paper, we looked at uh, uh, fossil communities. We created a network ecosystem as fo of fossil communities. We applied community detection algorithms uh, to find the paleo communities that occur in them. Uh, then we explored uh, these paleo communities and how they evolve over geologic time. We created a metric called total swing. Uh, total swing is a measure of uh, the ecological impact and ecological change uh, that these extinction events have uh, through geologic time and the future to follow. Um, and so we were able to rank all the mass extinctions that have occurred so far as per their uh, ecological impact 
And I think it'll be pretty cool to apply something like this, this methodology to the sixth extinction, sixth mass extinction, which is ongoing, and see how it ranks <laughs> comparatively. So uh, that's pretty much it. Thank you. So you can use fossilized Facebook records. For this. Exactly. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, uh, my name is Kevin Blissett, and I'm in Professor Hung Ji's lab. Uh, and one of the really important issues we're working on in that lab that I'm focused on is called information extraction, which uh, we mean, by information extraction, we mean taking a document in a given language and extracting from that document automatically the important entities and relationships between entities and events that the document describes. Um, and one of the first and most important steps in that process is called entity discovery and linking. And entity discovery and linking means, given a document, you want to identify all the strings in the document that refer to important entities, such as people or organizations or countries, and link those mentions to their corresponding entries in some knowledge base, such as Wikipedia. Um, and that linking step is important for a couple of reasons. One is that uh, Wikipedia contains a lot of information that might be important for our processing. Uh, but a second important reason is that linking to uh, some anchor in a KB allows us to identify which mentions are referring to the same entity, especially across languages. So, for example, if we have a uh, some text in Arabic that is linked to the Wikipedia page for Russia, and we have some text in English that is linked to that same page, then we know that those two strings are referring to the same entity, even though they're in different languages and totally different documents. Um, one of the problems you face almost immediately with this, though, is that not all entities are in Wikipedia. For example, my name, Kevin Blissett, wouldn't appear in Wikipedia because I'm not in Wikipedia yet, right? But, <laughs> but uh, we still want to especially cluster those together so we know which mentions for those entities are, uh, you know, co-referential, which ones belong in the same clusters. So those mentions we call nil mentions, and we want to do nil mention clustering, especially across languages. So kind of within a document or within a language, Clustering those nil mentions together, you can get away with simple string similarity metrics or things like that. But especially across languages or in more difficult circumstances, you need better tools. Like, uh, for example, using deep learning to read the context of a mention and compare that to other contexts with uh, other mentions and determine which ones are most similar to each other. So that's what I'm focused on right now. Um, in particular, I'm working on a model to read context that will be trained in a multilingual setting. And then can, you can add support for a new language just by a simple fine tuning with a much smaller data set. So that's what I'm focused on. Thanks. Thank you. Why is support multilingual already? Great. And we're looking for yeah, a look better entity result. You tell them, brother. <laughs> Okay, uh, hi, I'm Robin. So I'm working with Professor McKinnis. So my thesis topic is about uh, context aware and the tax oriented. Uh, ontology recommendation. So one uh, major use of the taxonomy mm -hmm. and ontology nowadays is we use these to do use for all kinds of annotations so as to train deep learning on machine learning models. So one, but uh, a key differentiate uh, a key difference between uh, ontology and the taxonomy is uh, I consider ontology as a subset of taxonomy because it contains much more information. Uh, regarding to the behavior of the entities and the relationships between them. So it's um, more than just a hierarchical, like subclass only uh, taxonomy. Um, so consider the case like for nowadays many entity linking tasks, uh, when they do the entity linking to ontology terms, they usually only consider the hierarchical uh, information, which is mainly just a subclass of property when doing such kind of uh, a classification, uh, training of the classification task, which results in you always linking the entity mention or the relation to the bigger or broader ontology, which has a larger coverage of all the uh, terms, like uh, of, of all the entity mentions you captured, but uh, without like uh, going in deeper to further acquire or analysis the real relationship or the uh, deeper attributes embedded within the ontology, which is described as a more domain-specific knowledge. So, um, so give a easy example. So we consider the map of this capital area as a taxonomy, um, but we have three different tasks. One can be I want to find where's the Winslow building. 
another person might want to look for the parking lot of this Winslow building. But a third person, maybe he's already in the parking lot, but he wants to know how many uh, parking slots, uh, spots it has, whether it has a shelter or not, or whether there's a, uh, what's the nearest uh, gas station uh, to this parking lot because my vehicle is out of uh, fuel. So um, this all can be described in a large taxonomy, but uh, the reality is usually we have three different ontologies for these three different specific tasks. So my work is I more um, emphasized on taking either a paragraph, a sentence, natural language sentence, or an entity pair as the input. I will uh, actually um, learn, uh, consider all the uh, useful information, including not uh, besides label definition, also the relationship and the properties between the entity pairs, and also the um, some other constraints, including range and the domain, so as to give a better prediction of what's the uh, best ontology fit that fit your text mining or classification task. That's it. Thanks. Oh, right here. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Fei Fei Pan. I am a PhD student uh, with Professor Peter Fox. And um, I have a 12 talk this year. So basically, the diamond formation thing has already been covered if anyone's there. Um, what else? Uh, I'm currently working with uh, people from Carnegie on a small data set problem that's uh, applying machine learning to relatively small data set instead of doing the big data thing. Um, there's a lot of data set in geo geology domain that are very small from 30 kind of rows to like 100, 150. So um, what we wanna do is try to analysis um, the data set and then predict um, minerals and um, conditions and environment on other planet. Um, what else? Oh, I, and I'm taking um, NLP this year, so I'm doing a term projects, um, generating, um, automatically generate taxonomies from um, geological publications, journals, um, all kinds of uh, scientific resources. So yeah, that's kind of it. Thank you. Hey. <laughs> I'm Eric Amers, and hey, I'm no Eric. longer a, uh, or I guess technically I might still be a grad student for another month or so, or a few days. Some days. of that, I'm done. Um, so for years, for years I've been running around telling people how, how cool the campfire is. If you haven't seen it, it's basically, it's, it, we get a good background in for that. It's a concentrically arranged multi-projection focusing inward real-time exploration. Uh, it's basically, it looks kind of like a fire pit. You have projections inside, and there's a floor that you project on as well. And it's kind of cool for visualizations, uh, particularly circular visualizations. If you're familiar with like circos graphs or any type of core diagrams and things where they're using kind of circular layout, uh, you can do it in kind of interesting ways because it has these, uh, these walls and floor for, for projection. So for years, I've been running around telling people how cool it was. And Professor Handler has been saying, well, prove it. <laughs> and uh, so uh, for a while we were talking, well, can we do it, you know, on a theoretical basis or a, a, a priori basis and all this kind of stuff and trying to avoid a, a, an awful user study and, you know, human experiments and all that kind of stuff. But in the end said, okay, we're going to actually do a user study. So um, designed a study, uh, ran the study, brought in people, IRB approvals, all that kind of stuff, had a reportable uh, a, a result and a effect that is inconsistent, is consistent with other things in cognitive load theory and proving that uh, people do, uh, you can reduce people's cognitive load or more effectively take advantage of cognitive loading uh, by employing this sort of uh, visualization device. So I'm done and that's it. <laughs> but the campfire goes on though. So we're, we're, we're still more on, a, on an idea basis. We're still now looking at implementations and that's right. uh, things to do on it and now use all these cool ideas. All right, I, I, that's an advertisement, that didn't count against my time. <laughs> I was going to advertise it. Too. I was going to advertise it. Yes, yes. Hi, I'm Brenda Thompson, uh, first year PhD student under uh, Peter Fox. Um, I 
did a TWED talk a few weeks ago about evidence-based women's health policy. Um, my work on that is obviously going to continue. I have a lot to learn about the data part of it. Um, I am going to be working with Katie. I'll let her explain what's going on with that. But um, I am going to be working with Katie to further explore my data and, and uh, more efficient ways to do that. Um, other than that, I have, um, I'm working on an RDA project, Re Research Data Alliance project, um, regarding uh, dynamic data citation and scholarly link exchange and getting those implemented on the Deep Carbon Observatory. Um, and say, and I'm going to do, actually, uh, I was granted full access to the archives of the National Women's Hall of Fame. Um, so I'm going to look, take a look at what early data collection of women's health data looked like and uh, how that was collected and affected uh, women's health for sure. So, um, and I'm focused also in the next month on getting Margaret Hamilton into the National Women's Hall of Fame. So <laughs> other than that, uh, that's pretty much it. So I'll let, pass it to Ahmed. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, my name is Ahmed Kalish. I work with Professor Fox and the project that I want to tell you about is a brand new project. We just started working on it. We call it Lake AI. Um, it's sort of a partnership for IBM. With IBM, it's a remote sensing project. So we're looking at satellite and aircraft imagery, spectral imagery. Um, we're going to start by trying to detect and characterize lakes. Uh, so it's a machine learning AI approach to looking at this data in terms of, of trying to detect and classify lakes. And then perhaps perhaps even over time, study how the, their characteristics have changed. Um, we want to use cloud services for that, build up a data pipeline uh, where we take these images, uh, clean them up and find the interesting features, the lakes, and, and characterize them over time and then study them. It's more of an, um, we're focusing on lakes, but there's kind of an exploratory aspect to this project. So we will really see what we can find out uh, from these uh, spectral images. Thank you. All right. Um, hello, everyone. I'm Ananya. Uh, this is my first year here as a PhD student with uh, Professor Hangji and the Blender Lab team. Um, so over the past semester, I've mainly been uh, working on and um, learning about event extraction. Uh, so where we um, extract specific knowledge about like certain events from uh, texts. Um, so if we have like person A travels to New York City in his car, we would want to know that uh, the event that happened was this person traveling um, and person A was the one who was traveling and the vehicle was his car and he went to work. City. So uh, I've mainly been uh, working on how to perform this task in like a low resource language setting where we have minimal uh, resources. So. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, my name is Tong Kao, and uh, I'm from Professor Hengji's group. And uh, for this semester, I'm working on uh, event extraction with imitation learning, specifically inverse reinforcement learning. It is a branch of RL. So someone has asked me a question is what's the difference between reinforcement learning and the supervised learning? Because it seems to us we still need to train, to train a model with some ground truths, with some negative examples, or some data features. And uh, according to my observation, the main uh, difference is for traditional supervised learning, we only tell the model or tell the machine, we explicitly say which one is correct, but we just implicitly give an impression about say, okay, other labels should be wrong under this condition. So the model will try its best to get a high score by doing something correct. But for reinforcement learning with a reward function, we will provide something negative and with some penalties. And the model will try to get a high score with, uh, by doing something correct and by avoiding the mistakes. And for my current research focus in imitation learning or inverse reinforcement learning, I design a reward function, which makes sure that some mistakes can be extremely wrong. So the model can know that, okay, I will be very likely to avoid this mistake to get high score. That's my current uh, 
impression and uh, my uh, focus will uh, further uh, the exploration of the area. And that, that's what I'm down for this semester. Thank you very much. Right. Well, we can catch her when she comes back. Well, let's do uh, this one. Did uh, Spencer or Alexander show up? Car? Hello, everyone. My name is Kara Reedy. I'm a third year student working with Jim Hendler, and my current work is on diploid neural networks. So a typical genetic algorithm is haploid or has one copy of the genetic material, whereas diploidy means having two copies of the genetic material. And this seems to have some advantages over this haploidy technique in genetic algorithms. So my current work has been on creating a genetic algorithm that uh, is diploid and encodes for neural networks. And this semester, I've been focusing on comparing two versions of this diploid neural network algorithm with a haploid version of it in order to see, you know, is it actually better than haploidy? So the hypothesis I had based on previous research in this vein was that the haploid version might be better in a static and unchanging environment whereas the diploid, ver the diploid versions should be better in changing environments. So I used the simulation environment with three versions, one of which was static and two of which could change over time. And the results I got were not quite what I expected. Uh, the haploid version was actually in between that of the two diploid versions in terms of performance. And the two different diploid versions behaved really differently one actually performed better than everything else in the static environment, whereas the other performs best in the most difficult changing environment. So my next steps are to understand what's going on there better, um, to try and figure out are there any kind of environmental characteristics that we can use to predict what sort of genetic encoding will work best and be most suitable, and also trying to integrate this work with my actual main research interests. Right. So, it was uh, Z Chen. Yeah. Sorry, <laughs> I didn't decode your name. It's under alternative label. Yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, I forgot to check the, the source. Okay, so. Uh, I'm Jason, uh, so I'm a third year PhD student working with uh, Professor McInnes. So uh, today I'm gonna talk about some, uh, the, uh, I want to summarize what I, uh, the papers that I write, uh, that I read for my research work this semester. So it's mainly about uh, knowledge graph reasoning uh, and representation learning over knowledge graph. So the, um, so in machine learning community, so the uh, the representation of, of KG is usually viewed as a, a structure, a, a, a static state relational uh, learning problem. So uh, the motivation of this um, uh, problem is uh, is that the learned uh, rep a better rep a representation of the entities and relations uh, can be used for a lot of downstream uh, application. Uh, such as uh, we can use this representation to uh, predict the uh, missing edges uh, in the knowledge graphs, or uh, or we can use these uh, uh, representations to estimate uh, the uh, probability the probability of the uh, of a specific triple, or use this representation to uh, clustering to cluster the uh, entities and relation in the KG. For, uh, for some uh, automatic typing. So uh, uh, in summary, there are two, uh, two main uh, categories of models uh, 
uh, to model the uh, correlations uh, between the large graph triples. The first one is a uh, latent uh, feature model, uh, which assumes that the uh, truth values of uh, large graph triples are conditionally uh, independent, uh, given the uh, features from the uh, SPO, the subject uh, relation uh, objects, uh, the triple. Uh, so uh, uh, I've, the, the major represent, uh, re representatives of this Kind of model includes the, the rescale uh, and uh, neural tensor network, uh, structure embeddings, and transit. So this is the very popular models in uh, in the uh, SRL com uh, research community. So uh, the second category uh, category is the uh, the graph feature model, which assumes that the true values of the triples is conditionally independent given the observe uh, graph uh, features. So uh, it's, it's pretty, uh, it's pretty uh, related to the uh, knowledge based reasoning, uh, knowledge graph reasoning task, but which is to infer uh, informative uh, uh, inference path between two entities in the knowledge graph. And the, um, the earliest work uh, uh, of this type is called uh, Path ranking algorithms, which use uh, random walks to extract uh, features for uh, predicting the uh, a specific edge between two entities, and uh, the state of the arts uh, is to uh, use uh, reinforcement learning to train agents to explore the uh, large graph to find the informative path between two en uh, two entities. So uh, after reading this pa uh, this kind of uh, this set of papers, I uh, my thoughts is uh, is that um, so knowledge graph reasoning is uh, has a has a strong uh, connection with uh, question answering over knowledge graph. So uh, especially in the case where uh, the answer of, to the question uh, does not uh, exist in the knowledge graph explicitly, so that uh, we need to um, do some instant reasoning or uh, combine information uh, from the uh, uh, question in the form of uh, natural language of some uh, background materials, uh, some natural language text to do some uh, 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 collaborated uh, reasoning, uh, some kind of that to achieve uh, to finally uh, obtain the answer. So that's my idea. So thank you. Thank you. Go ahead. Uh, hi, my name is Paul Liang from Professor G's group. And uh, uh, for this semester, I've been working on a, a sequence labeling model. Uh, actually, um, the, the baseline, the traditional sequence labeling model is a CRF RSTM. Uh, model, uh, which is pretty standard uh, deep learning model. And uh, what I'm working on is trying to improve the, mo improve the model to improve the model to like globally uh, aware, uh, be aware of the context of a document of, or a corporate corpus. So the baseline model can actually uh, is processing the sequence uh, um, each at a time and uh, separately. But uh, in fact, uh, especially in, uh, in the NLP, NLP community, community. So uh, those sequences could come from the uh, same document or the same corpus. Actually, they are not isolated. They share some context information between each other. So naturally, like for human, if, if, if we are reading a sentence, we cannot reckon, recognize the name in a sentence or we, can, we cannot decide uh, what, is the, what the name uh, refers to, like uh, it is a person or uh, it is a, a company. And uh, naturally, we are going to uh, look at some other uh, some other sentences to find the answer. So I'm trying to uh, here. This is the intuition, and um, I'm trying to improve the the current six model by adding uh, some of the hidden states uh, of the word in other sequences uh, when predicting the current sequence. So um, and uh, the result turns out to be uh, pretty good, and uh, it uh, significantly outperforms the the baseline. And uh, yeah, and uh, 
Hi, I'm Neka. I'm working under Professor Jim Handler and also Professor McGuinness in Hills Lab. Um, Guys. I'm here to talk about my interest, which is in personalized medicine for developing nations. And my focus will be in, on African nations because I'm actually from Nigeria. Uh, well, my main interest in this is because uh, although Nigeria has a much lower incidence of cancer, we have a higher debt rate than the United States. So we have an eight, over 80% mortality rate for cancer. So if you eventually get cancer in Nigeria or any African country, you're almost certainly going to die. And also there were incidents in, of uh, HIV resistance in Zimbabwe that caused uh, hallucinations and deaths. And they didn't realize they were getting the wrong HIV drug which the, uh, most of the genetic material of the people there, they were uh, resistant to the HIV drug until it became a national problem. And so my interest is in um, personalized medicine, uh, helping Africans, especially the patients, to get the information about drugs and diseases. So they'll be able to uh, mostly go online to find out why a particular drug is not working on them, or better yet, what's um, being done in the Western world or what are people most like me? Uh, what are the drugs or what are the therapies that they have over there? And what can I do to improve my situation? So that's basically my interest. Awesome. Uh, so Hara, I will go to give the <laughs> give the last uh, talk of the today's light talk um, because we can really enjoy the pizza. So I'm Dilly, I'm the first year PhD uh, candidate from Professor, uh, Professor Henry's lab. And since I want to introduce an uh, idea about parallelized uh, stochastic uh, gradient descent algorithm, uh, which is inspired by my um, by a, a course uh, named parallel computing course I took this semester. and. Uh, I also know that the um, stochastic uh, gradient descent algorithm is very useful for many machine learning languages to find the optimal um, optimal problem, um, and especially when training massive data. And uh, I think the key idea is we can take the sequential uh, algorithms into parallel to reduce the execution time. Uh, so. Um, the basic idea is we can distribute the massive data into different patches and let different processors to run their own batch. But we need this processor to com communicate with each other and uh, um, share the uh, optimal vari variables and update the variables or parameters um, simultaneously. Uh, so I think uh, we have already applied these algorithms to a linear regression model. Uh, it's very easy. Um, and achieve uh, a very uh, good uh, speed up on execution time. So I think the idea may be helpful to reduce the uh, training time on your model and let let you do um, not so struggle to catch the submission deadline of conference. So thank you. Did we have anybody who's up here who hasn't spoken yet? Do we have anybody who isn't up here who wants to speak or should speak? <laughs> No? Do you want to do a job? What? No. <laughs> I want to get you out before eight. Um, did, did, did you want to say one? Yeah. yeah. So thanks, everybody, for doing. I'm Deborah McGinnis, uh, one of the three Constellation Chairs in Tableau in this world. Um, and thanks, to everybody, for coming and doing such great jobs on the talks. A um, couple things. Well, I'll make some announcements after we kill the feed. Yeah. Um, but uh, there's a, an announcement in today's, um, what is it, RPI morning mail about a new award that we got. Somebody, oh, Katie mentioned it, uh, the dynamic spectrum allocation. Actually, we got it a few months ago. It just took us a while to get it out. So we're doing knowledge infrastructures for a lot of different uh, kinds of data. This is for spectrum. Um, but we're doing more health in the environment than anything else and uh, really have an exciting team. And I want to do a pitch. 
Um, there's an ontologies engineering class in the fall that it'd be great to have more people take because one of the things we're trying to do is try to use semantics and analytics um, together and, um, and extraction techniques together. So we're trying to blend the professor's expertise areas. And with that, I think that's it. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Is that just listed in the course catalog or where is that? It I'm should be listed in the course catalog. Okay, you are yeah, saying yes. For it. Is it just a special topic? Oh, um, no, it's ontology. Okay. Yeah. yeah, actually, some places it's listed as ontology. Some places it's, it's listed as ontology engineering. And previous years it was taught in the other term, so it got a little confused this year. All right. Okay, great. Yeah. So uh, thanks, Greg. Yeah. So has anybody signed up for Data Analytics Research Lab in the fall with uh, Professor Bennett and myself? Take a look at it. Data Analytics Research Lab. Yeah, while well, we're doing advertisements. Yeah, that's right. Um, the RPI, our users group, is there anybody in the Capital District that doesn't know about the RPI, our users group? I Not make after key. all your announcements. What's that? Not after all your announcements. That's right. So I think that's about it. Um, so that's it for this term for TWED. Thank you for everybody who participated. We had a great lineup for all of you who attended the, the TWED talks or gave TWED talks or attended the IDEA talks or IDEA slash TWED talks or the RPI or users group. There is one uh, RPI or users group uh, next Wednesday at this time. Um, we haven't figured out what the topic is going to be other than eating pizza. Um, and um, and again, as, as Eric alluded to, um, we, are, we are ramping up uh, our campfire visualization development. I have a number of students who are working with me uh, this summer on a variety of different uh, cool data visualizations of different kinds, and we're going to keep that going forward, um, and a lot of other stuff. Uh, and so with that, I think we're... Well, and uh, we're having a pretty active summer. Um, where we got a lot of people coming in and we're going to try to have some more like active lunch discussions. So watch Tetherless for suggestions yeah. like Jim often does this. Hi, I'm going to be in the, the lunch room at noon. We're going to talk about X semantics or whatever. that outstanding invitation from now on. I will try to remember to post it, but it'll happen whether or not I post it. <laughs> yeah. And there will be lots of act our activities during the second half of the summer. There's going to be. Oh, yeah. I think we're off, right? <laughs> no, no, I'm still. Oh, we're still on. Well, this oh, okay. is still this is still you know public okay. stuff. There's um, during um, during the second half of the summer, uh, uh, second summer term starting in July. There's going to be uh, pretty much a RPI or users group meeting every Monday night. Uh, that'll be uh, health. Uh, analytics focused in one way or another in support of the uh, United Health Foundation funded health data insight program. Um, there will also be periodic uh, uh, meetings during the first half of the summer. We just haven't scheduled that yet. That's much more informal supporting our team of hackers who are going to be with us this summer. Um, and with that, I think Oh. And there's the idea party next Tuesday. Next right? Tuesday, the idea is having a reception in the Sage Dining Hall, um, 3 p.m. Yeah. Come to meet all the cool idea associated people. And congrats to everybody who's graduating, and definitely consider going to the colloquy uh, if you haven't already planned to go. And it's usually have, fantastic. And if you have papers submitted in various conferences and journals, pray. Yes. <laughs> okay. All right.